everybody. Welcome to One Life Church. My name is Sarah. I'm on staff here, and I'm really thankful to be able to be joining with you today. Um, we really have just been enjoying finding new ways to connect with each other um, and grow in faith. And we know that God has something for every single one of us as we're engaging in this time today. Whether you're watching live, whether you're watching uh, sometime during the week on demand, we're so thankful to be able to join with you. If you're watching with us for maybe the first time, maybe somebody invited you, or maybe you're thinking about sending this to someone and inviting them, we would love to just have some conversation, get to know people, get to know the best way to connect with you. You can go to onelifechurch.info, fill out a digital little connection card and we'd love to just be able to get to know more about you as you're getting to know more about One Life Church. Guys, we have so many cool things that are coming up. We're excited that we know on August 30th, uh, if you're someone who engages with One Life uh, in a physical location, uh, we're going to be ob opening back up our buildings for two services. And at the second service at each campus, we're going to be offering uh, kids ministry. And that may look a little bit different each week. Just keep checking onelifechurch.org. Click on your campus. You can find information about uh, what's open for kids ministry and uh, times for your campus as well. We're so thankful uh, for all the people who have jumped in and have said, hey, I want to be a part of helping shape the next generation and people who have said, hey, I want to be a part of helping broadcast together our services. Our services are going to look a little bit different beginning on August 30th, and we think that that is something that's important. We want to be proactive instead of reactive to all the changes that are happening. So we're bringing together all of our teams uh, from every campus, and we're going to be creating a service that we think everyone can engage with, help us all uh, connect to each other and grow in faith. And so maybe you have some interest in helping with a broadcast team with cameras, or maybe you have some interest in helping even with something like social media from a distance, but you want to be connected to people because we say here that every group and team helps people trust and follow Jesus. It's not, it's not just doing something, but it's connecting to each other, growing in faith together as well. So uh, again, onelifechurch.info, maybe you're interested in those things. We'd love to be able to have a conversation with you about that. We're so thankful that you've taken the time even right now just to spend with us and, and be spending together. Know that you're not watching alone. Even if you've watched um, later in the week, know that other people have continued to connect with the service as well. We start all of our services right now with a time of worship through singing where we can just kind of stop, slow down, respond, and just hear what God is speaking into us. And then we're going to hear from one of our elders, Mark Weaver, who's been uh, continually teaching us on the joys of generosity. And then we're going to uh, follow up with Brett Nicholson and we're going to continue our series, True North, on the Gospel of Luke. So thanks so much for joining us. Let's go. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Show me who you are. 
Hello, One Lifers. My name's Mark Weaver. I'm speaking about generosity today and, and the kingdom of God. 
This is from Luke chapter 12, uh, starting with uh, verse 22. And this is Jesus, and, and he said to his disciples, he says, For this reason I say to you, do not worry about your life, that is, as to what you will eat, nor for your body as to what you will put on. For the life is more than food, and the body is more than clothing. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap. They have no storeroom nor barn, yet God feeds them, and how much more valuable you are than than the birds. And then he goes on to say, but seek his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. And he says, don't be afraid, little flock, because the Father has chosen gladly to give you the kingdom. And so I love this. He says, don't worry. And when I hear things like that, how is that working for you? When somebody just says, just don't worry, just stop it. And and for me, the only way to actually not worry is to see Jesus as the answer in this. And, and, And Jesus is saying, but seek first my kingdom and all of these things will be added unto you. And so I think about myself when I'm worrying, I'm worrying about my finances and I'm worrying about my kingdom. But The first thing is whenever we look at his kingdom and being in his kingdom, we learn it's not even about us. I know that busts a lot of people's bubble. You mean this life's not about me? No, it's about being a part of his kingdom and becoming love uh, to the others around us. The second thing that happens with this too, instead of it being my kingdom, and if I'm looking at my kingdom, I'm worrying about attaining something that I will have to maintain in my kingdom. But in God's kingdom, anything that's attained is empowered by him, and anything that's attained is also maintained by him on an eternal basis. On the temporal basis, my kingdom, I've got to keep spinning like a gerbil on a wheel, but he maintains the things in his kingdom. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you that you are the answer, that you're the one that when we seek you, You add all of these things unto us, everything that we need for your kingdom. And that also just takes care of us and our needs too. I thank you. Amen. So on the screen, there are ways to give to one life. Thank you. Well, hey, everybody at our East Campus, our West Campus, and in Henderson and online. And what's the thing that's really cool is online. I keep hearing about Pittsburgh and Montana and some other places. So it's kind of cool that uh, people are watching online that way. And what I want to let you know is just a reminder that coming up on August 30th, we're starting a new series. And we're also going to change our approach to how we produce our online services and our services, period, for the purpose of being able to encourage everybody to host watch parties, either online or at their homes, so that people that you know who are far from God, that you would love to see or uh, hear about these things and hear who Christ is, uh, you can invite them and uh, participate with them in that. We'll be telling you more and more about that as we approach that date, but keep that in mind. August 30th is coming up, and that's going to be good times. Let me ask you a question. Uh, How are you when it comes to rules? Uh, Are you a rule keeper? Are you someone that, man, tell me the rules and I will do the rules? Or are you kind of a rule breaker. I mean, and maybe you don't break rules, but you're kind of rebellious against them. I, I'm a rule keeper slash breaker because I do get a little bit of an attitude towards rules. I, I often ask why they're the way they are. Uh, do we really have to do it that way? That doesn't seem practical. I have kind of a cynical streak in me that makes me that way. Maybe you can uh, relate to, the, uh, to that. Uh, one thing that's interesting about rules, always remember that most rules are reactions to something that actually happened. For instance, I saw this, don't know if you knew this or not, but in Switzerland, it is on the books, it is illegal to hike naked. That, that's a thing. They, they, you, you, it is illegal to hike naked. You can get a ticket, you can get fined. Uh, but you know what that means? It means that 
somehow in Switzerland, there was a group of people once upon a time, or maybe lots of people, that just decided they were going to hike naked. And they had a problem with naked hikers in Switzerland. And so someone had to pass a law. Someone had to make a rule. Rules are reactions to things. They try to head us off at the pass on things. Now let me ask you about this rule. What do you think about the mask rules? And I know one thing you probably think about is you wish I hadn't brought it up. It's like, it's like the controversy going on in our culture now. People are debating. You know, and there's people on extremes of the, the whole thing of masks. Should you wear a mask? And some people are like, no, it's an assault on our freedoms. It's against the Constitution. It's, it's something that we shouldn't do. There's no ob- uh, uh, objective uh, Evidence that it's even useful at all. And then on the other end, you have people, absolutely we should wear masks. And they're kind of going around and scolding other people who don't. And they say, I wear a mask not only in public, I wear a mask in my car. I wear a mask in my shower. You know, masking is everything. It's this debate. It's a a rule we're trying to uh, come to terms with. One of the things that I love about the Bible is that even though it's a culture away and it's thousands of years away in many cases, what you'll discover is that people in the end, as they're presented in the Bible, even though they're in a different culture, different place, different geography, they're still people. And they react to things much the way we would. Now, what we're doing is we're going through uh, the Gospel of Luke. It's one of the biographies of Jesus. And if you haven't been with us, what we've been trying to do is discover who Jesus is from those biographies. So, and not just our assumptions about who he is or what we, or he's rumored to be or what we think he might be. What we're really trying to discover who he is, what he's about, how he thinks about things, how he processes information, how he relates to people, how he responds to issues. And one of the chief things that he responded to in his day and that he ran into a lot of controversy and he was navigating was the rules around the Sabbath day. He was in a Jewish culture. And what we uh, saw in Luke chapter 5, in Luke chapter 5, we're introduced to the primary antagonist in Jesus' life. They are the Pharisees and teachers of the law. And the Pharisees and teachers of the law have have come up to the area where Jesus was because he's got a huge following. Masses of people are following him around and they're checking him out. They're examining him all the time. And by the way, that's not a bad thing. Uh, It's okay to see if someone has a following or they're saying a bunch of things that you don't want people to be led astray. So they're checking out this new rabbi and what he's doing and what he's saying. And so we're introduced in chapter 5, but then in chapter 6, where we're going to begin today, we start seeing them respond to the chief rule of the day, and honestly, the controversy of that day. And it goes like this. Now, it happened that he was passing through some grain fields on the Sabbath, and his disciples were picking the heads of grain, rubbing them in their hands, and eating the grain. But some of the Pharisees said, why do you do what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And Jesus answering them said, have you not even read what David did when he was hungry and he and he and those who were with him. How he entered the house of God and took and ate the consecrated bread, which is not lawful for any to eat except the priest alone, and gave it to his companions. And he was saying to them, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Okay, so that, you know, it's easy to kind of see what the setting is. It seems pretty, uh, pretty casual, kind of not a big deal. But they're walking around the Sabbath and they're going through the grain fields and they're rubbing their hands uh, together to get some of the grain. Uh, and, and, and it's interesting. I don't know if the Pharisees were kind of walking next to them, watching them all the time, or they just saw it from a distance or heard about it. But they did know that they were doing this. And uh, it, it's interesting, too, that they don't tag them off base for, obviously, that's some farmer's grain, uh, that they were stealing the grain. Because did you know that it's, on, it's in the Bible, it's in the Jewish law, that when you're walking through an orchard or you're watching, walking through a grain field or something like that, you can pick individual fruit or individual, uh, you know, some wheat or something like that and eat it. You just can't get a bushel full. That's, that's actually considered not stealing if you do that. That's one thing. So that's not why they tag them off base. They tag them off base because in their view, they're working on that day. Now, the easy cliche thing to do is, is to kind of look at these guys as they're just a bunch of uh, you know, wound up tight religious people that are all about the rules and not about the relationship. But I want to throw them a little bit of sympathy 
Because we need to understand kind of where they're coming from. If you go all the way back in Jewish history, you have to remember that the Jewish people strongly identify with the fact that they had been slaves of the Egyptians for 400 plus years, much like African Americans in our country. 400 years. That was their heritage. In other words, there was a time when they knew nothing but slavery. Your great-great-grandfather was slave, and you knew that your great-great-grandchildren were going to be slaves. And they had cried out to God, the Bible says. They cried out to him, and they said, let us go. Please get us out of this mess. And God does. And not only does he take them out of slavery, but he does something that we should have done when we let people out of slavery. We, he takes them into prosperity. He, he gives them what he calls the promised land. And he says, I want you to go to this place. And here's the thing. Uh, I'm going to turn you into complete society. And I'm going to give you some ways to live. And if you'll live that way, and if you'll do what I say, things are going to go well. And you're going to enjoy the things of life. You're, you're going to you're going to prosper, and you're going to have laughter, and you're going to have joy. You're going to be able to raise your kids. You're going to have all the things that essentially bring life meaning. You're going to have that stuff. And among those things is I want you to rest. Which think about how good news that was to slaves who had never known that. I want you to have regular rest. Matter of fact, every seven days I want you to rest. By the way, that's, that was unprecedented in the ancient world. Uh, the ancient world was mainly guided, they divided up their time by lunar cycles. So it was, it was on months instead of weeks. This idea of every seven days and weeks and resting, our idea of a weekend, you can thank Jewish people for that. That's where that came from, that idea. Not only did he do that, but he also set up times around the year when they were told to rest. They were told to Sabbath, because that's what it literally means, for full weeks at a time. They would have festivals. And some scholars would say we get a lot of our ideas around a vacation and festivals and things of that nature from them. That's where they, we borrow that from. So throughout the year, they were getting a break every seven days, and they were getting several different kind of holidays during the year. Well, they were doing this, and they were prospering. But what God also tells them before they go into their promised land, he says, listen, here's what's going to happen. As you guys are going to do well, and everything's going to be awesome, but the problem is you're most likely going to forget about me in the process. And if you do... I'm going to take you out of there. You're going to lose that prosperity. Well, that's what happens. And they go through and they, they, they kind of get away from God and they do the whole thing. And God uses another country at one point to remove them from the land. That's a very, very traumatic thing. Think if that happened to us. Russia or China or one of those countries comes in and, and invades the United, States, the United States. And not only does that, but literally pulls us all out of our homes and our geographic areas where we've made our homes and takes us to a completely different place where the language is different and the landscape is different. Everything's different. They had had that experience and their ancestors had. So that was traumatic. It was a traumatic part of their history. And there were essentially three reasons, top reasons, why God said it happened. Number one is that they had been guilty of idolatry, which was putting other gods in front of him. Number two, they had been guilty of injustice. They had oppressed and exploited the poor. But number three is they had violated the Sabbath. They had forgotten rest. And we ought to throw a lot of sympathy their way on that too because you know what kind of society we have right now? A 24-7 society. That's how, we, that's how we do things. A lot of times, you know, we're seven days a week, 24 hours a day. Things are, are very frantic in our society. They got that way out of greed and everything else. So they, they knew that punishment had come and they'd finally come back to the land. And honestly, they were just kind of twitchy about that whole subject. They didn't want to mess it up again. So that was the first problem. They're watching this and they've built all kinds of ideas around it. Nobody violate the Sabbath. And maybe walking through a field of grain is working. And that was the second problem. Not only were they twitchy because of their history, they were also concerned because someone back there had asked, okay, God said not to work on the Sabbath day. Well, what's work? How do you define work? What does that even look like? And there was all kinds, as you can imagine, debate over that. Does that mean you can't move a chair from one side of the room to the next to you know, adjust your sights for the TV? And actually, there was all kinds of uh, rabbis, uh, hundreds of them had commented and, and argued for hun hundreds of years 
Actually, this was all, and this was called the oral tradition during uh, Jesus' day. There was the oral tradition that was interpretations of these things that was written down later in what's called the Talmud. And part of the Talmud is called the Mishnah. And actually, I, I looked up the Mishnah uh, on a Jewish website, a modern-day Jewish website, and I found a list of how they, an Orthodox website, where they listed off, what the Mishnah does is it lists off categories and actions of work. And you can see they've at least thought it through. They said, okay, when God says not to work, what does he mean? Well, let me, let me show you this list of the things that they came down on that you probably hadn't even thought of. You can tell some of it's agriculture. Look at this. Uh, sowing, plowing, reaping, gathering and binding, threshing, winnowing, selecting, grinding, sifting, kneading, baking, shearing wool, cleaning, combing, dyeing, spinning, stretching the threads, making loops, weaving threads, separating the threads. Here's my favorite, tying a knot, untying a knot. That could be work. Sewing, tearing, trapping, slaughtering. You can tell they're getting into, uh, aren't you glad you don't have to do that and cook your own food that way? Skinning, tanning, smoothing, ruling lines, cutting, writing, erasing, building, breaking down, extinguishing a fire, kindling a fire, striking the final hammer blow. That's a quote. I don't even know exactly what that means. And carrying. So in other words, what's work? And if you define maybe taking off the heads of grain and rubbing them in your hands as work, well, you violated a thing. So that's the dilemma. That's the problem. You have people who are very, very nervous about they've broken this rule in the past and they don't want to do it again. But they also have said, okay, well, how do you define where we want to be careful with this? Now, remember what we're after. That's the setup. And Jesus is asked about this. And what we're trying to do is find out how he thinks about things. How does he look at topics like this? How does he respond to people? And that way we can fix our eyes on the real Jesus when it, when it comes to times like this and we can get perspective on life. And I think there's at least three characteristics that Jesus exhibits when he answers the question that we need to remember, especially as we have debates in our time, our day and time, on issues like this. The first one's this. He was biblical. He was biblical. You notice what he said? He said, have you, have you not read? Now, that was a rhetorical question. These people had read. Have you not read? And he was talking about the Old Testament. He was biblical. Now, this is a very important thing that's come up before. And I think it's, it bears repeating because whenever we look at the real Jesus, who he is and how he's revealed in the Gospels, one of the things we have to remember is that Jesus had a very high view of what we know as the Old Testament part of the Bible. He did. And actually, he quotes a story that we're going to look at here in just a minute. But he was biblical. He looks back and he says, have you not read? Now, it's interesting to note what he didn't do. Because I think sometimes, you know, I've been around Christian culture long enough and church culture and everything. I often hear people kind of hand wave things like they'll say things like if, a, if an unusual rule comes up or something from the Bible, people will just kind of say, ah, that's just the Old Testament. Just wave their hand. Ah, it's just the Old Testament. That doesn't apply to us anymore. Okay, yeah, but, you, but you'll notice that Jesus was a lot more thoughtful. He wasn't superficial. He had a very high view of the Old Testament, but he also had the ability to walk through it and really think through it. I want you to see the story he was quoting. He said, had you not heard about uh, Abimelech the priest or Ahimelech the priest and all this? Here's the story behind that. The setting is that David, King David, is running away from Saul, which he spent most of the first part of his life doing. And he comes to a town. It says, David went to Nob, that was the name of a town, to Ahimelech the priest. Ahimelech trembled when he met him, and he asked, why are, uh, why are you alone? He thought he was alone. He actually had some companions kind of hiding away. Why is no one with you? David answered him like the priest. The king sent me on a mission and said to me, no one is to know anything about the mission I'm sending you on, which actually was true, but kind of not true, and that's interesting. As for men, I have told them to meet me in a certain place. I told them to meet me here. Now then, what do you have on hand? Give me five loaves of bread or whatever you can find. But the priest answered David, I don't have any ordinary bread on hand. However, there is some consecrated bread here, provided the men have kept themselves from women. And then this is actually my favorite line. David replied, indeed, women have been kept from us. <laughs> you know, you, you can't be with any women. Hey, we were trying to get dates, but we couldn't. Uh, as usual, whenever I set out, the men's bodies are holy even on the missions that are not holy. How much more so today? So the priest gave him some of the consecrated bread. Since there was no bread there except the bread of the presence that had been removed from before the Lord and replaced by hot bread the day it was taken away. Now there's a whole lot going on in there. 
But here's what's, no, what's worth noting is that Jesus is actually, he's not only in-depth quoting a little bit of an obscure place in the Bible, so he's biblical, but he's also doing something legal because technically speaking, the Pharisees could have ratted out the disciples and had tried to have them prosecuted for doing what they did. He, they're doing something that is a violation of the law, period. And we're going to tell the authorities. But what Jesus is doing, he's actually doing something very, very shrewd. Scholars and commentators have pointed out that he's giving a legal argument from the Bible. So he knows that that's what they respect, that's what they hold as authority, but he also knows his way around it. And he's giving a legal argument, kind of like a lawyer, to them. And they know, after they hear him, they can't take him to the authorities because they're like, yeah, I guess that's really true. Because what he's saying is, the high priest at that time took bread and gave it to David, and the high priest was the authority. And if the high priest thought it was okay to do something that, technically speaking, the law says really you're not supposed to do, that, that bread is only for the priest to eat. In that case, he took the authority and he gives that to David. If he thought it was okay at that time, well, why can't I do that now? And what's really wild is that Jesus is doing all this kind of multi-layered stuff. I think he's putting himself in the place of the high priest back then and also of David at the same time. Because remember... When Jesus is being biblical, he's not only just kind of being legal and kind of playing the game that way, he's also always pointing to the fact that he is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. And he's trying to get them to see that. Now, the second thing he does, he's not only biblical, he's what I would call principled. He's principled about this. He, 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 he knows what's going on underneath these passages and these rules. And that's what's so important for the rules. I mean, you know, I don't know. Can you imagine being in the, in the room when they were discussing whether or not to make uh, a naked hiking uh, illegal in Switzerland? Wouldn't you hate to be a part of those conversations? I bet you're actually uh, kind of hating the fact that I keep bringing it up, right? You just keep hearing that. It's, well, imagine the going back and forth. I should be free to be naked hiking. Well, what's going on underneath? Well, the people who made the law were like, we want to spare everybody else that, right? We, what's going on underneath is we're thinking about other people. Jesus was principled. And he's saying David and his companions were hungry. And in the end, human life takes a priority that we need to know about and we need to understand. Now, I've been trying to stay very, very close to the book of Luke as we going th we're going through. There's also Matthew and Mark and John of the other gospels. But I'm trying to follow Luke pretty tightly. But every now and then, and I know what's in the others, but I, I want to grab something from the other Gospels. And actually Mark uh, tells this exact same story, but he does include something that Luke does not. And I think there's a reason that we'll talk about here in a moment of why I think Luke did not do it. But Mark adds a line that I want to add. As Jesus says the exact same thing, he refers back to the Abiath of the priest, and the, or him like the priest, and he says this, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. Jesus was biblical, but he was also principled. And he says, guys, you know, you're arguing about the Sabbath all the time. I know, I know we're wondering about what work is, and we're kind of all really wound up tight about what are we violating or are we not. But let's get to what's really going on. Why God really delivered that. And he says a Beautiful thing. That's why I didn't want to pass it over. In the account with Mark, he says, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. The rule was made for you, not you for the rule. And that reveals, in that one sentence, it reveals so much about the nature of God. That I know for in my own life was one of the greatest breakthroughs I ever had. As I went back and forth, I would come to church, and then I, my story is I would come to church, and I would kind of get cleaned up, and then I would go back out and do a bunch of things I shouldn't do. And then I would come back to church and get cleaned up and go back out and do a bunch of things I shouldn't do, back and forth and back and forth. But one of the greatest breakthroughs I had was when I re did really recognize that the rules that God gives in the Bible, whether it's Sabbath rest or sexuality issues or any number of things that the Bible speaks to 
It's driven by his love for me. It's driven by his desire to see you thrive. Because one, one of the things that I, I remember reading the law, and you can go through the law, and, if you, and you can pick out, he tell, he's telling them how to do their hair and what to wear, and he gives all these rules that don't necessarily apply to us anymore. But why was he doing it? You really understand it when you see that they had been slaves for 400 years. They had no clue how to be a society. They had no sense of any identity whatsoever. And so what he was doing, he was constructing a society from the start, and he was giving them an identity. And what's beautiful about it is even though I think they've missed out on Jesus being the Messiah, which is tragic, the Jewish people to this day, thousands of years later, are known as having an identity. That's one thing they have, is they have a very solid sense of who they are. And that's what he was doing. In other words, The Sabbath was made for you. You weren't made for the Sabbath. God didn't come up with this rule. I want to do this every seven-day rest thing. Okay, now I'm going to make someone and just tell them to obey it. It works the exact other way around. God made us. And he manufactured us in a way where he knows what brings us joy, what brings us meaning, what brings us hope, what brings us love. And he says, hey, okay, if you want to get there, here's how you do it. One of the things you need to do is every seven days, you know, for six days you work and you go after it and you, you, know, you produce wealth and you live your dreams and, you, and you, you get out there and you do your crops and you do all this stuff that you do. But hey, at least every seven days you need to stop. Don't do any of that stuff. You need to worship. You need to chill out. You need to relax. You need to just breathe. And in a 24-7 culture, that still sounds very relevant, doesn't it? The Sabbath was made for man, not man or the Sabbath. The rules were made for us, not us for the rules. In the most cliched way to look at it is, you know, those every single parent who has ever loved their child knows that they have rules that are are framed all around and they are driven by the desire to see. Our kids thrive. And sometimes kids don't understand that. They balk against it and they push back against it and they, 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 they yell and scream and whine and cry and everything else. But you know, you know as a parent, I'm doing this because I want you to thrive and I want you to flourish. The rules are not made. You're not made for the rules. The rules are made for you. Which brings me to the last thing. Jesus is not only biblical, he's not only principled, but he was also personal. And by that I mean he pointed to his person. What Jesus says here is a remarkable thing. And this is the pattern we've seen over and over and over again when it comes to Luke as he presents Jesus. If we want to really know who Jesus is, he keeps making statements about who he is because he finishes this whole thing off. And this is why I think Luke left out that principal one. He wanted to skip to just, here's what Jesus said. He said, oh, by the way, the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. In other words, I am the son of man. He kept calling himself. And this is really my thing. And I can make whatever rules around I want it. And these guys are just fine. I'm the one in charge anyway. Which was remarkable, crazy. And and if you didn't believe who he really was, that was something that was horribly heretical. But the reason they don't react, some commentators have pointed out, it was kind of a um, a mysterious statement. It It was kind of a statement that was... Um, hidden a little bit because they could have interpreted him as saying, which wasn't out of line, well, son of man can mean all of humanity in their language too. That humanity is in charge of the Sabbath. So I'm just claiming to be a man and I can make the calls around that. I think Jesus did that intentionally because he was very smart and he was very shrewd and he wasn't superficial about how he handled things. That he's actually making the claim that he's, he's in charge. He is the Lord of all the earth. But at the same time, they would have heard it as he's just claiming to be a person who can make his own decisions about the Sabbath at the same time. Why does any of that matter? Because I don't know about you, but with all of our controversies around mask wearing and and our (laughs) coming up on election day, you know, there's, there's, there's red versus blue and it's just going on more and more in our societies, fractured as much as we've ever have. Don't you long for the day when Jesus comes and says, this is what's right and this is not what's right. 
That's wrong. This is right. And that's exactly what he's called to do. And that's exactly what he's going to do. And that's the hope and the beauty that we have, that someone is really in charge. And someone is coming. We can find him in his word, but he he promises to come back someday where he's going to say, this is how things are supposed to go. This is who was right. This is who was wrong, because I'm in charge. And that's something we need to remember and bow our knees to. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, I come before you right now, and I thank you for making the rules for us and not us for the rules. I thank you for the freedom that you you give, that you were driven by love for us and the desire for our flourishing, and I pray that that will be something that we grab hold of deeply, that we won't see how you want us to operate life as something that's oppressive, but something that is freeing. I ask that you'll help us to remember that Jesus is Lord of all, and as long as we're following him and have our eyes on him, that we're going to be okay. And you sort through all the stuff that goes on our lives. We love you, and we thank you for who you are, and I pray to worship you as worthy of who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, I've been processing a lot about all these things that are changing um, in my own life and everyone's life. What are the things that aren't changing? Because I can focus on those and know that those kind of are the foundation. And for me, that is the gospel. I know that um, Jesus is who he says he was, uh, that he uh, is fully God, fully man, came to earth and allows us to be back connected to God in the way that we were always meant to be. And it's a beautiful story that is something that is true, that's something that we can be a part of. And for me, that just helps me kind of keep a solid foundation. Everything else can change, but I know if that's true, it's okay. It's all going to be okay. So maybe you've never read the Gospels before. Um, You're not even sure what the Gospel means. Uh, I would totally tell you to start reading the Gospel of Luke. We've been going through that together in our True North series, and it really does give you an opportunity to connect to God one-on-one personally and read that story and just know Um, that it is something that really did happen. And so we'd love to be able to have more conversations with you. Maybe you're still looking for a place to get connected here at One Life Church. Check out the One Life Anywhere Facebook group again. I know I mentioned that earlier. Just go to Facebook, type in One Life Anywhere, join that, and it's a good place to even just ask some questions and go through some of the stuff that's on there. Also, we use uh, this space as well. If you're watching live, uh, you can uh, join one of our uh, virtual lobbies that happens after each service. It's just a time for us to visually see each other, connect, say hello. Uh, It could be really simple as saying like, hey, I haven't seen you in a while, Um, but just use that as an opportunity as well to connect with each other. Also, we'd love to pray with you. Uh, You can go to onelifechurch.org slash prayer, or if you're watching live, click the live prayer button. Thank you so much for joining us today. We really do love you. We love being able to learn with you. I'm so thankful that you're here. We'll see you all throughout the week.